Hello everyone, I'm Himanshu Asnali from Department of Mechanical Engineering and I'm here to discuss with you on a subject, Material Science. The subject code is ME207, unit number 5, lecture number 32 in the series. And today's topic are Corrosion Fatigue, Methods of Protection from Corrosion and Metallic Coating. So, let's start with today's objective. Uh, to provide the students with a basic understanding of Corrosion Fatigue, Methods of Protection from Corrosion and Metallic Coating. A learning outcome of today's lecture will be the students have learned the basics of corrosion fatigue and metallic coating and students have understood various methods of protection from corrosion. So, we have been studying about various corrosions, various types of corrosions in the previous lecture. So, let's study about stress corrosion. This type of corrosion was also termed as stress corrosion. Okay, cracking. So, it's produced by the combined effect of mechanical stress and a corrosive environment on a metal. So the stress that produces this type of corrosion need not be externally applied. It may be a residual one that results from the rapid temperature changes and uneven contraction. Okay, what happens? It may be a residual one that results from rap rapid temperature changes and uneven contraction or for two phase alloys in which each phase has a different coefficient of expansion. So, one may note that in the presence of corrosive environments, the strained area, what happens? The strained area acting as an anode, while unstrained area as cathode, gives rise to a type of galvanic cell called as stress cell. I repeat, in the presence of corrosive environments, the strained area acting as an anode, while the unstrained area is acting as a cathode, which is helping you give rise to a type of a galvanic cell called as stress cell. Okay, so in stress corrosion, they say this, that this type of corrosion, this need not to be externally applied. Okay, it may be a residual one that results from a rapid temperature changes and uneven contraction of a two phase alloy in which each phase has a different coefficient of expansion. Okay, now obviously, air corrosion starts at the strained area due to electrochemical action of the cell. It is found that the stress corrosion rate is dependent upon the corrosive agent, time, and temperature of exposure, behavior of protective films, and stress magnitude. In stress corrosion, they say that is found that stress corrosion rate is dependent upon the corrosive agent, the time and temperature of exposure, behavior of protective films, and stress magnitude. Each of these factors are important. They have an individual contribution in the stress corrosion rate. Okay, in stress corrosion, what happens? There's a cracking. It is produced by the combined effect of mechanical stress and a corrosive environment on the metal. You can see in that diagram how it is shown. Okay, in the upper diagram, how the crack is shown. In the bottom diagram, how this stress corrosion is taking place. There is anode, there is cathode. You can see the pit at the anode is there available. So under high stress, uh, tensile stress, the absorption of hydrogen in metal causes embrittlement. This phenomenon is usually known as hydrogen embrittlement. So when mild steel exposed to alkaline solutions at high temperatures and stresses, one can observe hydrogen embrittlement. So just remember one thing, the stress corrosion rate is dependent upon some factors and the factors are like corrosive agent, time and temperature of exposure, the behavior of protective films and the stress magnitude. Okay, you can see this diagram of stress corrosion, I told you about this diagram previously also. You can see how the, you can say the crack is creating and the, how the anode and cathode are shown in this. Okay. So this type of corrosion this occurs predominantly in metal components having internal stresses which may be due to the cold working or otherwise 
and being used in corrosive environment. Okay, you can see in the diagram in the one how this uh, stress corrosion is taking place, how the crack is propagating. Okay, so they say that this crack is it is this kind of uh, stress corrosion rate. It is predominantly found in metal components having internal stress and being used in the corrosive environment. So, in fact, some materials that are virtually inert, let me say, some materials that are virtually inert in a particular corrosive medium become susceptible to this form of corrosion when a stress is applied. I repeat, understand. In fact, some materials that are virtually inert in a particular corrosive medium become susceptible to this form of corrosion when a stress is applied. So pile up of dislocations at grain boundaries and in cold work metals increases the energy in such a region and makes anodes in the structure in certain environments. Small cracks forms and then propagate in a direction perpendicular to the stress with the result that failure may eventually occur. Okay, so some materials uh, when you talk about inert materials, there are some materials that are virtually inert in a particular corrosive medium become susceptible to this form of corrosion when the stress is applied. So you can see the how this uh, stress corrosion is applied. Okay, so season cracking in a brass, especially in the presence of moisture and traces of ammonia and caustic embrittlement of steel exposed to solutions containing sodium hydroxide are few well known examples of stress corrosion okay so they said these examples of stress corrosion they have given like season cracking on brass and caustic embrittlement of steel okay so these are a few examples of stress corrosion so the most effective control of stress corrosion is the elimination of stress, tensile stress from the component part or the lower magnitude of the stress. They say the most effective control of stress corrosion is the elimination of tensile stress from the component part or the lower the magnitude of the stress. This may be achieved by reducing the external load or increasing the cross sectional area perpendicular to the applied stress how you can do you can this can be achieved by reducing the external load or increasing the cross sectional area perpendicular to the applied stress so an appropriate heat treatment may be used to anneal out the residual thermal stresses so in case of cold work metal the corrosion takes place at the strain portion Okay, this corrosion this takes place as the strain portion. So in the strain area, the atoms of the metal are not in their lowest energy position. So consequently, the strained area, the strained area where the corrosion is taking place, the strained area of the metal having internal stresses has higher electrode potential than the strained free area. That is why the corrosion takes place at the strain area due to internal stresses so it is having high electrode potential than the strain free area okay so now the corrosion fatigue this is another kind of a corrosion you can see in the diagram also uh, in both the diagrams you can see how the crack is there on the upper side and the bottom side you can see how this corrosion fatigue is acting you can see the crack on the bottom side so it is also a very important kind of corrosion so this type of uh, failure this is a type of failure that results from simultaneous action of a cyclic stress and a chemical attack i repeat this is a type of a failure that results from the simultaneous action of a cyclic stress and chemical attack now it is well understood that corrosion becomes the cause of cracking while fatigue may cause the crack propagation. Okay. 
it is well understood that corrosion becomes the cause of cracking while fatigue may cause the crack propagation okay because corrosion earlier also was giving a cracking in the stress corrosion so we can understand that corrosion becomes the cause of cracking and fatigue may cause the crack propagation so a corrosion crack may propagate even under static stresses we know that the combined action of corrosion and repeated stresses is far more serious than the sum of these two factors acting independently okay the combined action of corrosion and repeated stresses is far more serious than the sum of two factors acting independently so corrosion fatigue is also reduction of fatigue strength of materials due to the presence of corrosive medium so the alternate slip taking place at granular legal creates minute regions of high strain energy which tends to become anodic with respect to surrounding regions of low strain energy so the effect of corrosion fatigue is clearly observed in heat exchanger where variable stresses are produced because of the thermal expansion and contraction the effect of this corrosion fatigue is clearly observed in heat exchangers where variable stresses are produced because of thermal expansion and contraction you may say that under corrosive actions and fatigue loading the material is in the most critical state under corrosive conditions and fatigue loading the material is in the most critical state okay so when you say about this uh, corrosion fatigue so in this you can say that the corrosion becomes the cause of cracking while the fatigue may cause the crack propagation and you know that the uh, corrosion crack may propagate under even static stresses so the combined action of this corrosion and repeated stresses is far more serious than some of these two factors acting independently okay so the effect of this corrosion fatigue is observed in heat exchangers okay and under corrosive conditions and fatigue loading the material is in the most critical so corrosion fatigue is also very important type of corrosion acting in the industries okay so one can express the effect of corrosion fatigue strength by the damage ratio the damage ratio is equals to corrosion fatigue strength upon normal fatigue strength okay damage ratio is equals to corrosion fatigue strength upon normal fatigue strength so damage ratio for salt as a corroding medium is approximately 0.2 and for carbon steels okay for carbon steels and approximately 0.5 approximately 0.5 for stainless steels and about 1.0 for copper you see the damage ratio for salt as a corroding medium is approximately 0.2 for carbon steels 0.5 for stainless steels and about 1.0 for copper for the treatment of the corroding medium and surface protection of the metal may be suitable protective measures against corrosion fatigue okay so how you can do this you can say that by by, by the treatment of corroding medium or sand surface protection of the metal these can help you to protect against corrosion fatigue okay you can see in the diagram how this this corrosion fatigue is acting okay how you can see in the bottom diagram you can see in the pipe and how it is acting how the crack is shown in the diagram okay you can easily understood with that okay how the crack is propagating in this so this uh, 
corrosion fatigue type of uh, corrosion this should be taken care of okay it should be taken care of a fretting fretting corrosion is a type of corrosion which occurs at interference between material surfaces under high pressure if slight slip occurs you can see in the diagram how this fretting corrosion bands are shown okay through different different arrows you can see the vertical uh, you can say uh, signals signs vertical lines also you can say these are shown with the help of arrows okay so it is having the fretting corrosion bands with the help of arrows which is showing you so fretting corrosion it is a kind of a corrosion the fretting corrosion which is kind of a corrosion which occurs at interference between material surfaces under high pressure if slight slip occurs usually this type of corrosion takes place when two closely fitted metal surfaces example when bolted or riveted joints or press fitted her metal hubs uh, or shafts are subject to vibrations this type of corrosion it happens when two closely fitted metal surfaces like uh, when bolted or riveted joints or press fitted hubs or shaft on shafts are subject to vibration so molecular plucking of the surface particles takes place i repeat molecular plucking of the surface particles takes place in the initial stage which oxidizes to form a debris so in case of steel this debris is like red rust this in case of steel this debris okay the surface particle which is oxidized this debris is like a red rust so fretting corrosion depends on load temperature humidity presence of oxygen and metallurgical factors so you can see this fretting oxygen is dependent upon so much factors such as the first thing is load okay because it is if the material is under high pressure and slipping is there then obviously it will take place then load is important temperature humidity and presence of oxygen because uh, you need it there and metallurgical factors so one can minimize the effect of this type of corrosion by avoiding relative motion between two surfaces by introducing compressor stresses and by heat treatment you can minimize the effect of this fretting corrosion by avoiding relative motion between the two surfaces by introducing compressor stresses and by heat treatment now fretting corrosion reduces at high humidities and increases in the presence of oxygen okay so presence of oxygen is an important factor so you have to you can say avoid it okay or you can say not avoid it you can reduce it the fretting corrosion and fretting corrosion reduces at high humidities and increases in the presence of uh, oxygen so you have to decrease this uh, presence of oxygen so it decreases with the decrease in temperature obviously it is found to be more in soft materials than in the hard materials so remember one thing the sweating corrosion it reduces at high uh, high humidity and increases in the presence of oxygen so you can control it if you uh, you can say if you decrease with the decrease in temperature also so you have to take care of these factors and you can avoid this kind of sweating corrosion okay but one thing is important the fretting corrosion depends upon the load the major factor then the temperature then the humidity presence of oxygen and other factors metallurgical factors now hydrogen embrittlement okay now let's discuss about this a significant reduction in ductility and tensile strength is observed when atomic hydrogen h penetrates into various metal alloys and specifically some steels this phenomenon is observed usually referred to as hydrogen embrittlement and sometimes it's called as hydrogen induced cracking and hydrogen stress cracking you can see in the diagram on the bottom side how the crack is propagating so they say in this that a significant reduction in the ductility and tensile strength is observed when atomic hydrogen penetrates into various metals alloys 
and specifically some steels. The hydrogen, atomic hydrogen, it penetrates into various metal alloys. Okay, and specifically some steels. So this phenomenon is usually referred to as hydrogen embrittlement. Okay, now we can say that hydrogen embrittlement is a type of failure. We can call this as a failure in response to applied or residual tensile strength. Okay, now you can see that in the first line what it was told to us was a significant reduction in ductility and tensile strength was observed when atomic hydrogen penetrates into various metal alloys and especially some steels and this is called as hydrogen embrittlement. Okay, and here it is saying that hydrogen embrittlement is a type of failure in response to the applied or residual tensile stress. So, brittle fractures occur catastrophically as cracks grow and rapidly propagate. Okay, you can see this fracture. It is the crack is growing and rapidly propagating in this. So, interestingly, hydrogen in its atomic form, okay, it diffuses interstitially through the crystal lattice and concentrations as low as several parts per million can lead to cracking. These hydrogen induced, hyd hydrogen induced cracks are most often transgranular. These are transgranular. A hydrogen embrittlement is quite similar to stress corrosion. Okay, so we should understand this. Now, in order to, in order that hydrogen embrittlement may occur, some sources of hydrogen must be present. And in addition, the possibilities for the formation of its atomic species. Okay, for this embrittlement, hydrogen embrittlement to occur, some sources of hydrogen must be present. Okay, so they said a pickling, a procedure used to remove surface oxide scale from steel species by dipping them in a vat of hot dilute sulfuric or hydrochloric acid of steels in S2SO4, electroplating and the presence of hydrogen bearing atmosphere including water vapor at elevated temperature, for example during welding and heat treatment are such situations where these conditions are met. So it is this is shown all the conditions in which these hydrogen embryo embryo may take place. Okay. Okay. So moreover the presence of poisons such as sulfur and arsenic compounds which acc accelerates hydrogen embrittlement. They these kind of presence of these things like sulfur and arsenic compounds these acetylate the hydrogen embrittlement. Okay. It accelerates hydrogen embrittlement. So we should be aware of such kind of situations where this hydrogen embrittlement is accelerated. Okay, and avoid, if possible, such conditions. Okay, but you should take care that presence of such uh, elements like sulfur and arsenic and amount, arsenic compound, it acetylates hydrogen embrittlement. So, this is something really uh, things to be known. Okay, uh, see, uh, we have been studying about various types of uh, uh, types of corrosion. Like uh, today, we studied about uh, you can say we studied about this hydrogen embrittlement and what are the factors that accelerate hydrogen embrittlement. We studied about uh, threatening, we studied about uh, you can say um, corrosion fatigue. So, these corrosion uh, types of corrosion are there and they are leading to some kind of uh, depletion in the working. So, uh, now we are going to discuss about uh, the various methods that will help you to protect from corrosion. So, perhaps the most common and the easiest way of preventing corrosion is the proper selection of material. So, once we have characterized the en corrosive environment. Now, see, based upon the past experiences, we have been knowing that which material can be selected in for which working condition okay or you can say that which material can give you a long life in those conditions because sometimes you cannot totally avoid the corrosion you can delay 
the corrosion. Okay, because if there is a corrosive environment nearby, so you cannot avoid it. And moreover, the things needs to be done. The functions of the various uh, the industry needs to work. So you can uh, choose some material in which the corrosive action will delay automatically. So the life of the part will be more. Or if possible, you can choose such materials in which you can avoid corrosion. So this is the most common and the easiest way of preventing corrosion. However, one has to examine the economic feasibility prior to employing the material that provides the optimum corrosion resistance. For example, one can use noble metals in very limited applications such as ornaments and delicate scientific instruments. Okay. So in order to control corrosion, the materials would have to be absolutely uniform without any heterogeneities in either composition or structure. And at the same time, the environment would also have to be entirely uniform. So the following methods widely used for the control and prevention of corrosion are like using high purity metals and alloy addition. In proper design against corrosion and proper modification of corrosive environment, making use of protective coatings, then making use of inhibitors, then cathodic protection. Okay, these are the four methods which you can use for control and prevention of corrosion. Okay, so let's discuss on them. The use of high purity metals and alloy additions. So one can corrosion resistance of a given metal by provide by avoiding galvanic couples. That is limiting designs to only one metal. However, this is not always feasible by selecting suitable electrically insulating metals of different compositions or an or by alloy additions, one may avoid the cell in special circumstances. So one can increase the corrosion resistance of most metals by alloying them with suitable alloying elements. Okay. Alloying may increase corrosion resistance by increasing the energy level of the solution. So reducing the driving EMF in the galvanic cell and protected and protective coating and decreasing the mobility of corrosive ions. Okay. So alloying may however help in the following ways like to avoid carbon precipitation in heat treatment or to prepare steels with high chromium content. So we know that chromium corrodes less readily. And I have told you the thing that you can choose the materials like which are electrically insulating materials of different compositions or you can choose some materials which, which uh, you can alloy some materials which you can say which have good corrosion resistance. Okay. So in this way you can uh, you can say uh, prevent corrosion. Now the third way in which alloying can help like to make steels containing strong carbide form. So titanium and tantalium are such elements. Interestingly, these elements do not permit carbon precipitation at the grain boundary. So these methods reduce intergranular corrosion in metals. This technique is mainly used in stainless steel, which must be fabricated by welding. And design against corrosion. So one can design to avoid physical contact between dissimilar metals so that a galvanic couple does not form. So in addition, the design should follow the complete drainage in case of shutdown and easy washing. The design should be like that. It should allow the complete drainage in case of shutdown and easy washing. So it is found that dissolved, uh, dissolved oxygen may enhance the corrosivity of many solutions. The design should, if possible, prevail, include provisions for the exclusions of the air. What they say? The design that should include provisions for the exclusion of the air. So in order to prevent, one may ensure the following points that as far as possible, avoid of dissimilar metal contacts. So when metal, when contract between dissimilar metals is unavoidable, one may take care that the metal forming, the anode does not have a small surface area as compared to the cathode. So there should be cathodic protection always. Okay. And one must avoid recesses and sharp corners and avoidance of excessive concentration with proper fabrications. Okay, one must prevent retention of liquid 
with airtight joints of the this is really important okay we should prevent the retention of liquid with airtight joints the surfaces must be clean free from foreign metals like dust dirt and soot okay we should leave no possibility of corrosion the design should be such that that there should be no possibility of corrosion where are possible one must use a corrosion resistant material okay if if cost allows then we can go with that okay if cost allows it can go with that so one must take care that the two different metals should be as close as possible obviously okay we should take care these two different metals different metals should be as close as possible but the thing is that one must use corrosion resistant corrosion resistant materials if the cost allows okay and we should free our surfaces from foreign materials like dust dirt and so okay and we should use air tight joints also so design should be like that now modification of corrosive environment it is found that a change in the character of the environment if possible may also significantly influence corrosion so we can achieve large savings in materials if these are used in less corrosive environment so lowering the fluid temperature or the velocity usually helps in the reduction of reduction in the rate at which corrosion occurs so what happens lowering the fluid temperature or the velocity usually helps in the reduction in the rate at which the corrosion occurs so one can modify the environment in the following ways like lowering the temperature pressure concentration velocity etc or by changing the humidity oxygen content oxidizing agent as solid impurities one may also alter the chemical composition of the environment okay so it is found that purified and dehumidified atmosphere around the structure helps in reducing corrosion see this chemical composition if you can alter but it will it is possible only when the it is allowed okay you cannot do because the function needs to be done okay the purpose of the you can say uh, process should be followed now by adding inhibitors that is those substances in low concentrations to the environment which decreases corrosiveness of the environment Okay, by adding inhibitors, that is the substances in low concentrations to the environment, which decreases corrosiveness of the environment. For example, alkaline neutralizers are used to prevent corrosive effect of the environment by neutralizing the acidic character of corrosive conditions. To prevent high temperature corrosions of ferrous metals and alloys, methane and inert gases are also found useful. So, of course, the specific inhibitors depends both on the alloy. The Specific inhibitors. It depends both on the alloy and on the corrosive environment. So another important thing that you can understand by modification of corrosive environment that lowering the fluid temperature and a velocity usually helps in the reduction rate, in reduction of the, in the rate at which the corrosion occurs. So if this it is possible, you can modify the environment accordingly. Now use of protective surface coatings. Now physical barriers of to corrosion are widely applied on. surfaces in the form of films and coating so there are good number of diverse metallic and non metallic coatings materials available so it is essential that the coating should have a good corrosion resistance when in use obviously this coating should have that and maintains a high degree of surface adhesion which undoubtedly requires some pre application surface treatment okay for good degree of surface adhesion they require a pre application surface treatment in several cases the coating must be virtually non reactive in the corrosive environment which is the main purpose and as is to mechanical damage that exposes the bare metal to the corrosive environment for this purpose you require a pre application surface treatment so it should be resistant to mechanical damage that exposes the bare metal to the corrosive environment so general three material types like metal ceramics and polymers are used as coating for metals now metallic coating okay this metallic coating is also very important because when you talk about coating so metallic coating is one of the most commonly used okay so in the protection of underlying metal by a metallic coating two factors are mainly involved like first is the mechanical isolation of the metal from the corroding environment and the galvanic relation of coating metal and the base metal so if the metal coating is a baser than the substrate like zinc and aluminum on steel a galvanic protection is offered to the underlying metal you see a galvanic protection is offered to the underlying metal so the coating is anodic and corrodes first however zinc and aluminum become passive after the initial attack nickel and chromium plating gives a decorative attractive appearance 
Okay, if you go with the nickel and chromium plating, it gives an attractive appearance. It, it depends upon the cost. Okay, the hard, hard chromium plating produces a chromium plating produces a in the tin coating on steel article is produced that tin plate may have excellent corrosion. The tin coating on steel article is produced so that tin plate may have excellent corrosion and fabrication quality. Now the most use, the most common use of tin plate is for making food containers. The following methods that are widely used to apply a metallic coating are like hot dipping, electroplating, metal cladding, high temperature diffusion, metal spring, etc. So you can see this electroplating kind of technique on the right hand side in the diagram on the bottom side. You can see there is an anode and cathode and you have a plating tank in it and there is an electrolyte in which anode and cathode are dipped. And from the other side you have the battery from which you have the positive and negative terminal uh, show. So you can see the width of the anode how it's shown as compared to the cathode in electroplating. Okay, the width of the cathode as compared to the anode. So let's start. Now the zinc coating on steel, that is known as galvanized coating, one of the most common coating known and the tin coating on a steel article are usually produced by dipping clean sheet steel into molten zinc or a tin bar. For the use, dipping a clean sheet of steel into molten zinc or a tin bar. So galvanized iron known as GI sheets. Is produced by dipping a low carbon steel sheet in molten zinc bar at about 450 degrees centigrade. Now, this galvanized iron is very, very commonly used in the industries and for domestic purposes also, and it's a very common name that by, we might have listened in our past years. So, galvanized iron is produced by dipping a low carbon steel sheet in molten zinc bath at about 450 degrees centigrade. In coating, crystallized forming zinc flowers when cooled in air. So articles, example buckets and drums prepared from galvanized iron are very suitable for aqueous environments. What they say? Articles like buckets and drums prepared from galvanized iron. Okay. Articles like buckets and drums are prepared from galvanized iron. These are very suitable for aqueous environments. So however, the lives of galvanized coating depend on the thickness of the zinc layer. Okay, the lives of galvanized coating depends on the thickness of the zinc layer and the environment condition. Okay, it depends on the thickness of the zinc layer and the environmental conditions. In the presence of oxygen, zinc chloride is precipitated as a protective layer. So one can obtain thinner uniform coatings of zinc and as in by electroplating. Nowadays the process is popular for those metals. For these metals, so, so like chromium, cadmium, and nickel platings are usually produced by electroplating. So you can just one thing is important that the lives of the lives of the zinc layer and the environmental conditions. So we have to be careful with that. Okay. Now this is the figure showing the electroplating which I have explained you. Now in this electroplating process, the coating metal is deposited on the base matter by passing a direct current through the solution. What they say in this electroplating process, the coating metal is deposited on the base metal by passing a direct current through the solution of electrolyte containing a salt of the coating metal. So the base metal is made, the cathode and the coating material is made as anode. I repeat, understand the thing, okay, how this electroplating process is made. So they say in this electroplating process, electroplating process, the coating metal is deposited on the base metal by passing a diode current through the solution of electrolyte containing a salt of the coating metal. The base metal is made from the cat made is the base metal is made the cathode and the coating material is made the anode. So we know that the coating properties mainly depends on the current intensity, agitation, temperature of the solution and the chemical composition of the plating solution. Interestingly, these coatings are relatively thick. What they say? These coatings are 
relatively thick and mostly applied to cast or machine parts okay they say these coatings are relatively thick and are mostly applied to cast or machine parts so comparatively thick lining is placed upon the metal surface forming a strong alloy bond between plates of two metals in metal cladding so the strong alloy bond is formed either by casting or hot rolling so the principal objective for cladding is the production of a corrosion resistant surface okay the principal objective for cladding is the production of a corrosion resistant surface okay so when we talk about this coatings so to understand one thing that these coatings are relatively thick and are mostly applied to cast or machine parts so we have to be careful with that now let's start with the mcqs okay the mcqs are also important let me check the mcqs so that we can start with those okay then one more line uh, one line there the use of powder metallurgy technique is made in the high temperature diffusion process so the met base metal is heated with the powder of the metal which forms the coating so okay now when diffusion coatings are formed on steel with the help of high temperature treatment it is found that the innermost core is rich in the base metal uh, followed by the successive richer coating processes in the presence of powdered aluminum the treatment is known as colorizing with powdered zinc as sheerizing and with chromium as chromizing so interestingly these coatings are thick by metal spraying metallizing or flame spraying thick coatings of any metal can be produced okay now let's start with the mcqs i think okay the mcqs are let me go okay yeah it's the first thing so when you talk about mcqs the first mcq says that uh, okay the stress corrosion it is a type of uh, corrosion this also this type of corrosion also termed as stress corrosion because the cracking is produced by the combined effect of mechanical stress and a corrosive environment on a metal so we have discussed a uh, detail about this so i think this statement is true that it is this cracking is the combined effect of mechanical stress and a corrosion environment on the metal this true is the answer a now stress corrosion the strat that produces this type of corrosion do not be externally applied it may be a residual one that results from rapid temperature changes and uneven contraction or for two phase alloys in which each phase has a different coefficient of expansion okay so what do you think is it true or false what do you think the stress may that produces this type of corrosion need not be externally applied so it may be a residual one that results from the rapid temperature changes and uneven contraction or for two phase alloys in which each phase has a different coefficient of expansion so what do you think is it true or false see we have discussed a lot about stress corrosion and understand the lines it will give you a clear explanation okay the stress that produces this type of corrosion need not to be externally applied okay it may be residual one that results from the rapid temperature changes and uneven contraction or for two phase change uh, two phase alloys in which each phase has a different coefficient of expansion it's true it's true now this is a okay the sort of stress corrosion in this the, in the presence of corrosive environments the strained area is acting as anode while unstrained area is cathode give rise to a type of galvanic cell or stress cell obviously corrosion starts at the strained area due to the electrochemical action of the cell it's true a is the answer now it is found that the corrosion uh, the stress corrosion rate is dependent upon the corrosive agent time and temperature of exposure behavior of the protective films and stress magnitude it's a the answer is a true is the answer a now erosion corrosion causes accelerated attack because it mechanically removes the protective layer it not it mechanically removes the protective layer that that normally builds upon the coating surface so it's true a is the answer now erosion corrosion this type of corrosion is generally found in piping especially at bent elbows and abrupt changes in pipe diameter position where so the fluid changes direction or flow suddenly becomes turbulent so propellers turbine blades valves pumps are also susceptible to erosion to corrosion we say propellers turbine blades valves pumps are also susceptible to erosion corrosion so answer is a true is the answer true is the answer a 
Now corrosion fatigue, this type of this is a type of failure that results from the simultaneous action of a cyclic stress and chemical impact. Okay. This is a type of failure that results from the simultaneous action of a cyclic stress and a chemical attack. So answer is A true. There's a corrosion fatigue is also a materials due to the presence of corrosion medium. So the alternate slip are taking place at granular legals, minute regions of strain. The strain energy which tends to become anodic with respect to the surrounding regions of low strain energy. So Q is the answer A. The damage ratio for salt as a closing medium is around 0.2 for carbon steel, 0.5 for stainless steel, and for 1.0 for copper. So A is the answer true. Ah. Uh, the treatment of corroding medium and the surface protection of the metal may be, su may be made suitable protective measures for against corrosion fatigue. You see, the treatment of the corroding medium, the treatment for corroding medium and the surface protection of the metal. Give us suitable protective measures against corrosion fatigue. So true is the answer A. Okay. And the statement, the statement is very clear. The treatment of the corrosion medium and the surface protection. Treatment of the corroding medium, one thing, and surface protection of the metal, second thing. It may, may be the suitable protection measures against corrosion fatigue. So true is the answer. A is the answer true. So these are the references which you can refer and increase your knowledge in these topics. Thank you.